Good evening. I'm Rabbi Joshua Davidson, Senior Rabbi of Temple Emmanuel, and I welcome you to the opening of our new Stryker Center semester. It is said that our enemies have always known where to hurt us. The Hebrew poet Chaim Nachman Bialik once described the synagogue as our house of life, the storehouse of our soul, where Jews celebrate life's most cherished joys and turn for comfort in loss. Throughout the ages, in the shtetls of Eastern Europe and the big cities of America, the synagogue has been present for the Jewish people as a symbol of hope and stability. Last Shabbat, we all watched in horror and terror as the hostage crisis at Congregation Beth Israel in Colleyville, Texas unfolded. More fervent than any other prayers we might offer tonight are prayers of gratitude that Rabbi Charlie Citron Walker and his congregants are all safe. And our thoughts remain with them as now they must recover from an unimaginable trauma. And don't we all feel it too in our own way? For once again, the spiritual safety which all people of faith seek in their house of prayer, once again, that security has been shattered. An evening with the extraordinary CEO and national director of the Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt, is always timely because sadly, the Jewish community seems always to be under some form of attack. But when we invited Jonathan months ago to be with us tonight, we had no idea his visit would be this timely, and we are so grateful to him. We know because surveys have demonstrated it that incidents of anti-Semitism are on the rise in this country. But are we as Jews and as America as a nation treating this crisis with the urgency it demands? That is among the questions Jonathan will address tonight as he joins us to talk about how quickly quiet prejudices can mutate and to suggest what we as individuals and communities can and must do to stem the tide of hatred. Jonathan Greenblatt's new book is presciently titled, It Could Happen Here. And he will be joined in conversation by Abigail Pogerbin, author of Stars of David and My Jewish Year, which was a finalist for a National Jewish Book Award. Abby is a consultant and frequent moderator for the Stryker Center and for UJA Federation, the Shalom Hartman Institute, and the Jewish Broadcasting Service. We'll leave time for your questions too, which you can pose in the chat function, and we'll get to as many as possible. So with great appreciation, I'm honored to welcome Jonathan Greenblatt and Abby Pogrebin. Thank you so much, Rabbi Davidson. Um, and it is good to be with all of you, although I really do wish, especially tonight, uh, that we were together in person. Um, and uh, Jonathan, let me just say hello to you um, so we can hear your voice before Great. I start the grilling. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, this is, as Josh mentioned, um, more timely than we wanted it to be. I want to start with Saturday's events. Um, I know you were um, deeply involved and we were all on the edge of our seats. Um, and as he mentioned, we could not be more relieved, more grateful that it ended the way it did. But it has, I think, shaken us in a way that other incidents have, but particularly now when we are seeing the spike that he described. So before we go into the actual specifics, can you just talk about what you've been hearing in the last 72 hours from synagogues, from institutions around the country who are, again, feeling somewhat de destabilized? Sure. So first of all, let me just start this session by thanking the rabbi for his really wonderful introduction. And I am super proud and humbled to have the opportunity to be, you know, this inaugural session for this season. I think Temple Emmanuel is such an institution here in New York, and it really helps set the pace of the public conversation for our community. So I'm gratified to be a part of it. I also could not be more thrilled to be with my friend, Abby Pogrebin, who's an author of some repute. God God willing, my book will sell just a, few, just a fraction of what hers have done. So I really it's admire it. It's working. The, the questions are still going to be tough, okay? I don't know. I don't know. But uh, So I really appreciate <laughs> you, Abby. You. And, and I'm glad to be in dialogue with you as someone who really understands our community the way that you do. And I think you always Thank bring you. nuance to those discussions. Uh, and I also just want to build upon the way this started. 
by just being thankful for the fact that that crisis on Saturday ended the way that it did with four people leaving unharmed. Um, and I have so much gratitude and just like respect for the, not just the heroism of Rabbi Charlie who deserves all of our praise, but all of the congregants who held it together in what must have been incredibly tense, incredibly hard, incredibly painful moment where they re- literally feared for their lives, as well as the law enforcement who did the, who did the good work that they did, particularly the FBI and the hostage rescue team. So, you know, again, we're Jews. And so I think it's important to give thanks at the start of this and uh, something like a secular bracha, just, I mean, how blessed we are, right? How blessed we all are. So I indeed would say, Abby, I have heard, been hearing nonstop from leaders all over the country um, over the last four days. I mean, when this happened, it's funny, Abby, it's like things happen on Shabbat. Shabbat's supposed to be when things slow down. I find in this line of work, it's when things pick up. I remember the Saturday in August of 2017 when the Unite the Right rally was just totally unraveling and Heather Heyer was killed. I remember getting that phone call. I remember the Saturday being in Shul in October 2018 when I was in Israel when that happened. I remember being in Shul in that 2018 was Pittsburgh. That was yeah, Pittsburgh. when Pittsburgh happened and my phone buzzing off the hook. I remember being doing lunch with my, um, my nieces and nephews and my family and my in-laws in L.A. on the Saturday afternoon in 2019 when Poway happened. It was the last day of Passover, if you remember. Uh, it was a lunch after Shul. Um, and now this, right? And so I was at home on, on Saturday afternoon when we got the call from someone at ADL. My chief of staff called and he basically said, hey, um, we just got word from the FBI about an emerging hostage situation at a synagogue in Pittsburgh, in Texas. It's not on the news, nobody knows, but we got the call and it turned out that some of our analysts from the Center on Extremism, you know, ADL has the center, who monitor extremist chats, like in the public web and in the private web and in the dark web. They had gotten word on one of those, like, on like a telegram group and were watching it live as it was beginning to unfold. And so from that moment, my phone hasn't stopped ringing. So and the so fact in that recent, it, in recent days, just, it's been Jewish leaders saying some being terrified, what do we need to do? Some being like, like I told you so, but everybody I think mm-hmm. feeling pretty resolved. Like we're showing up for Shul on Saturday. We're not daunted, but where do we go from here? And the I told you so, uh, tell us a little bit more about what that means. I told you so we should be armed. Is it I told you so this never stops? Uh, no, it's I have heard. I told you so we should be armed. If, I mean, something that I don't think the public fully knows. There's an FBI agent who's a member of that congregation who wasn't there because Rabbi Charlie had told people to stay home because of COVID. So I, I did hear if they had been there, it's an open carry state. They could have dis disarmed or disabled the hostage taker. We can argue about if it's a great idea to be taking guns in the synagogue. Um, I also heard that I told you so because this person was uh, a Muslim uh, from Pakistan or a Pakistani descent from the UK. And I heard people say, ah, you see that? Like it's Islamists. It's the radical Islamists. They want to get us, you know, uh, as I'm sorry. What's what's the anthem meme there is it's not the right wing extremist you guys are always telling us about. So, you know, I've heard both and, of those things from the I told you so. And the fact that this synagogue actually prioritized interfaith work and the welcome to Muslims and the fact that he in uh, Rabbi Charlie opened the door, in fact, um, a locked door um, out of compassion is there um, is the response to that that again we can't be as welcoming as our tradition in some senses not in many senses tells us to be and I'm particularly I know we've all been thinking of the 36 times in the Torah that we are told to welcome the stranger um, even at our seder tables it is a constant message and and there is something very concrete about that question now for institutions. Uh, like ours that have um, at either open or locked doors on Friday nights or Saturday mornings. Yeah, you know, I have heard friends like my friend Yossi Klein Halevi talks about the European the Europeanization of American Jewry. Right, like any of us who've been to Europe know 
I'm sure many of us on the Zoom, you want to visit a shoal when you go there and you have to send them your passport number in advance and you get checked at the door by a guard and oftentimes they're metal detectors, things that we just don't do, even though we do have a security cordon in most of our institutions. Um, look, I think, you know, the reality is two things can be true at the same time. Number one, we need security. Like, frankly, we need security from, from locks on doors and cameras, like the Group Secure Community Network does a really good job of that, uh, physical security. And cybersecurity, ADL does a really good job of that. And, you know, the intelligence so we can anticipate the threats before they happen. We work on prevent, this is why we do preventative work. Um, so I would say that we need security. And by the way, by the way, the challenge is that it's not just synagogues. Like, let's keep in mind, Abby, that it's almost seven years to the day that the kosher supermarket in, um, in Paris. Paris, was the Keeper Cachet Market was attacked. Three people or five people were killed. And it's two years and a couple of weeks from the shooting at the kosher supermarket in Jersey City, mm -hmm. right, where three people were killed. And by the way, I could tell you, we could, we could reminisce about the shooting at the Seattle Federation in uh, 2006, or the attack on the Skirball Museum in, in L.A. in 1999, or the attack of the JCC in Overland Park in 2014, or the attack of the Jewish Museum in Brussels in 2013. I could go on, right? So I think we need security, yes, but we also need to recognize we can never build walls that are high enough. So, you know, there are some on the right who say the answer is more security. There are some on the left who say we only have security through solidarity. I hear that too. No policing, more solidarity. Like, two things can be true at the same time. We need security through solidarity because, like, every institution can't become an impregnable fortress. So we need solidarity, and we also need security because we have to take precautions when the risks are simply very real. And in terms of the preparation that you say ADL does every day, um, Rabbi Charlie Citron Walker actually cited that preparation yeah. um, that he was trained of, of more than uh, several times. Um, uh, I was actually trained when I was lucky enough to be a president of a synagogue, but not everybody's gone getting that training. And I uh, sometimes it's, it's counterintuitive in terms of how to get out of these situations of God forbid they happen. Um, can you, without being, I know you can't be too specific about what the training is, but how is ADL kind of making, um, making people feel a little more reassured that they have some agency if they're not armed and, and let's put, let's put uh, guns in synagogue aside for the moment in terms of how they respond to this if they are, God forbid, in that situation, either in a place of worship or maybe even an institute, a Jewish institution. Um, so we do do, so a couple things. So number one, um, our theory of change is basically the best way to, to stop intolerance is to interrupt it before it happens, right? So we do, we, our center on extremism has been monitoring extremists for decades, right? Right wing, left wing, Islamist, Nation of Islam, Black Hebrews, um, armed militias, uh, uh, sovereign citizens, all kinds, okay? So we work regularly with law enforcement when we can identify a threat and we can ascertain um, kind of intent, capability, and location. We pass information to the appropriate bureaus. And we have deep relationships with all of these organizations. The fellow who runs security at ADL is a 22-year veteran of the FBI. Frankly, he used to run domestic terrorism investigations for the bureau out of the D.C. headquarters. He ran that for the United States of America. I mean, he was one of the top people at the Bureau, now he works at ADL. So we do a lot of preventative work, but we also work with communal institutions to help them understand what do you do in the event of a crisis? And so we've done all kinds of exercises about there are people in the building or there's a cyber threat or whatnot, and how do you respond in that moment? Um, look, I think the reality is, is that again, we cannot protect every kosher supermarket, every Judaica store right, every, every Holocaust museum. I mean, so we need those cameras and locks, but a kind of preparedness that people have are, is helpful so you understand how to respond in a crisis. And, you know, I was talking to someone, to, oh, I was talking today to one of my supporters, because before this job, I worked for President Obama in the West Wing, and I was there the day that Newtown happened. 
You know, I'm from Connecticut, not far from Newtown. And it was pro- definitely the worst, well, one of the worst days of my life, one of the worst days. Tell of us my what life. your job was, Jonathan, because you were not doing, you were not so focused on the Jews and the Obama administration. Oh, what was your job? So people not at all. understand. I was, I was special assistant to the president and I ran the Office of Social Innovation. So it was the mm-hmm. innovation shop in the West Wing that folks said, how can we accelerate economic recovery and boost job creation? So nothing to do with Jews or the Middle East or any of this stuff. Um, Although you went to the Hanukkah party, I hope. I did. <laughs> I keep kosher. So what I loved about the Hanukkah party, actually, you want to hear a funny story? I'll share this. I'm sure my wife- We could laugh watching, today, yes. I'm sure my wife, if she's watching, she'll be mortified. But, um, you know, there's only one, co- at the time, I think still there's only one kosher restaurant in D.C., and so I was commuting between L.A. where we lived and uh, D.C. my first four or five months on the job. And it was hard and it wasn't fun, and you know. And uh, there wasn't a lot to eat. So, But the great thing was the Hanukkah party, which I had never been to before. They have these amazing kosher lamb chops. So, And by the way, there's two parties, like insider tip. So they have so many people. They do a two-hour party. There's an hour break. They can reset and then they do another two hour party. So I went to the party, the first party, and I, uh, the kosher restaurant is called uh, Char Bar now. It used to be called Eli's. It was a deli just south of DuPont Street. It was a deli and it's, you know, it was like corned beef sandwich. It's not good for your cholesterol. But um, so they had these, they had these lamb chops, Abby, right? And they were delicious. And I literally spent, and I didn't know, I had just started at the White House a few months earlier. It was all the Jewish community was there, none of whom I knew. I knew people in tech in Silicon Valley. I don't know who the professional Jews were or the president's donors. I wasn't in politics before this. So I didn't know anyone. And they had kosher food, so I just ate lamb chops for four hours straight, <laughs> bouncing between, you know, event to event, which was delicious. Right. And I then I called Marjan, my wife, afterwards. I was like, oh, my God, they had the best lamb chops and then she was like, what did you do? And she was so embarrassed for me. But, you know. Was... I'm sure you'll hear from her. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure before we, we were going to turn to the book, but I just want to address the question of whether Saturday was an anti-Semitic event. Because there has been, uh, as you well know, some debate around that, at least particularly initially when the FBI described it as not necessarily. And I have the, the quote here. We do believe uh, from our engagement with this subject, that he was singularly focused on one issue, and it was not specifically related to the Jewish community. Okay. Um, now they backpedaled. Um, I think hours later, certainly a day later. Um, can you just give us some insight into why there was some reluctance, and um, what is the complexity around even calling it that, uh, labeling it that? So a few things. So I can tell you that the special agent in charge definitely screwed up. I think he communicated, he poorly communicated the situation. I think, I, I, I can't, I can't, you know, describe what his motive was, but I think to be, I mean, not breaking any news, but I think he buried the lead, as you would say. You go into a synagogue and take Jews hostages, uh, it's got something to do with anti-Semitism in the Jews. He didn't, cho- didn't choose the gas station or the grocery store. He targeted a synagogue, and the synagogue that was closest to the federal penitentiary where this woman, Afia Siddiqui, is being held. We can talk about her if you want, because she is an al-Qaeda operative and a a rabid anti-Semite, as has been well reported. As soon as we heard she was the person he was seeking, whose release he was seeking, we posted on our website an analysis that ADL did in 2010 on Afia Siddiqui, because we tracked her, we knew all about her, and the things that she said in public are, you gotta read them to believe them, you gotta hear them to believe them. That being said, um, the FBI did clarify that it was anti-Semitism, and I wanna say this loud and clear for everyone on this audience to hear, okay? An environment in which, you know, a gunman goes into a synagogue, right, with the intent of holding Jews hostage, because as this was the case, he believed that Jews run the world, that Jews control the government, and that, quote, Biden will listen to the Jews. That is anti-Semitism. Full stop. No ambiguity. And before you leave that point, the idea, which I think, especially reading your book, but also living in the last 
10 years, it seems like there's a misapprehension about the idea that Jewish power is not an anti-Semitic trope. And I feel like it's important, even on this call with many who I do do understand it, to clarify why saying Jews run the world or Jews run the media or Jews run government, why that that is actually anti-Semitic and not, it's, as some put it, in a category that isn't anti, expressly anti-Jewish. Yeah, I mean, we know there are certain places and certain people who envy Jews because they perceive that they control the world. We know that there are books out there, particularly in Asia, about like, you know, invest like the Jews or, 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 or investment secrets of the Talmud because they believe that the Jews control Wall Street. But these kinds of myths are, are, not just, are not just pernicious, right? They are dangerous. They stereotype Jews and lead people to believe that we, again, there are kind of conspiracy theories that lead people to believe that Jews are responsible for, again, all the, all the ills of the world, whether it's wars or it's financial calamity or it's misrepresentation in the media of their particular group or their particular issue and so on and so forth. So while it is certainly true that Jews do enjoy great privilege in this country, that is hard-earned privilege. A uh, hundred some odd years ago when ADL was founded, Jews had nothing in this country. No political power, no economic resources, no social standing. I mean, literally, we did not have anywhere near the cultural capital that we have today. We are where we are because of hard work, because of a lot of luck, because of extraordinary sacrifice. And because, honestly, organizations like ADL, long before I got here, worked hard to change the law and change costs, you know, and, and expose bigotry and, you know, affect the culture to make it more inclusive, not just for Jews, for all Americans. And there's still so much work to be done in that regard. Mm. Let's turn to the title of your book. Um, it's obviously behind you. <laughs> yeah. It could happen here. Uh, that's a big statement. Yeah. For you to first clarify what you are referring to. What could happen here? You know, I mean, what could happen here? I don't know. Go to services on a Saturday morning and find yourself held hostage by a crazed gunman who thinks that Jews control the world and is ready to kill you for that. I mean, look, what it, this book in large part for me was inspired by my grandfather. You know, um, my Jewish grandfather from Germany, his family had lived there all of their lives. It was the only place they ever knew. And then he never could have imagined the advent of the Third Reich, who would then regard him as an enemy of the state, destroy everything that he loved, slaughter almost his entire family and all of his friends, and force him to flee to this country as a refugee. And my wife uh, came to this country from Iran, and her Jewish family had lived there for as long as they knew. It was the only place they ever, they ever had known. And they never could have imagined, but that with the advent of the Islamic Revolution, that they would find themselves regarded as enemies of the state, it would destroy everything that they loved, and it would force them to flee for their lives. And they came here as political refugees. So my father-in-law, I'm sorry, my grandfather, never would have guessed when he was a young person that his grandchildren, me, and my siblings, and my, and my cousins, would be born in America. And my father-in-law, when he was a young man, never would have guessed that his grandchildren, my kids, my nieces and nephews, would be born in this country. And so, Abby, I don't think we can take for granted, you or me or anyone watching, that our grandchildren will be born in or finish their lives in this country unless we fight for what we have. Because our Jewish experience tells us that the it that could happen here is the marginalization of Jews, the unraveling of our society, the erosion of liberal democracy. I think these are existential, existential threats to our people and to other marginalized groups as well. You also write creeping authoritarianism, increasing divisionists, and an actual explosion of violence. Even here in this democracy, increasingly we realize just how fragile it can be. Um, you know, and I have heard constantly that there's very, there are too many instances where Jews who are concerned are considered hysterical or hyperbolic. Um, that this couldn't happen now, that you shouldn't be talking about, it's 1938 Germany. And I would say in the last, you know, again, few years, there had, there's been a division even there 
about those who insist we should be actually more vigilant, more frightened, um, more prepared in some way, more, I guess, anticipatory, like not waiting for the bad thing to happen. Um, can you just address the question of whether it is hyperbole to be even using a framework of Germany in the in the late in the late thirties? Is that even is that language you use and are comfortable with? It's a hard question. So look, um, for a few reasons. So number one, the Shoah was a singular event in human history, right? The, the, that a state of such modernity, so civilized, would literally orchestrate the systematic extermination of a transnational extermination of a people was previous to that, like unimaginable. It wasn't to say that atrocities hadn't happened. They certainly had. But people ascribed it to the old times or like some sec lo local sectarianism. The Nazis employed all of the tools of the modern state to literally extinguish the Jewish people and try to erase their memory from what was thought of, you know, the um, Western Europe or all over Europe, really, right? The, the center at that time, some would say, of like the world, certainly from an economic perspective uh, and what and political perspective. That is unique. And it was really the culmination of thousands of years of demonization and delegitimization of the Jews. So it didn't happen in a vacuum. And only the Jews have been so, over the course of thousands of years, I think, categorized and stereotyped and slandered in this way that in many ways laid the tracks for the, the cars to go to Auschwitz. So that is so unique. And so when you, when you say that Donald Trump is like Hitler or, Ronald, or, or Governor DeSantis is like Hitler, like these are these these don't feel right. They feel wrong because these people are not talking about organizing the slaughter of millions and millions of innocent people. They're not. And I think there are some in our community, and certainly outside our community, more so outside our community, who like to weaponize memory, right, and politicize the Shoah by saying, you know, Israel is committing Nazi genocide. It isn't. Just saying that. Getting a vaccine mandate is like wearing a yellow armband. It isn't. And so these comparisons feel wrong, even though there may be injustices that we want to address. At the same time, you know, the, our friends at the, at the claims conference, a few, uh, maybe it was last year, two years ago, had a campaign on social, Abby, that you may have seen. It was called, It Started With Words. And it did. And so we should have the ability to recognize that while there is a quantum difference, quantum difference between, you know, the death camps, the organized manufacture of misery and extermination that the Nazis did to the Jews, there is something uncomfortable and eerily, you know, rings a chord when we saw, you know, US border security separating women and children at the border, right? And like literally putting them in chicken chicken wire cages. So again, those weren't Nazi death camps or even concentration camps. But it start the dehumanization starts with words, and then you objectify people as if again their familial ties just don't matter, right? And then you 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 give them numbers, and then you lose them as happened is the case. So that is awful. And again, it is not the same. But history doesn't repeat itself, right there. As someone much more articulate than me talked about the fact that this doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes, right? And there's some truth to that. And we need to recognize that authoritarianism might not look like the Third Reich, but that doesn't mean it isn't poisonous and won't infect our society in lethal sort of ways. And you say that between 2015 and 2018, the United States saw a doubling of anti-Semitic incidents. Uh, in, tw in 2019, the United States saw more anti-Semitic incidents than it had in any year in the past four decades. Um, can you just give us a sense of the landscape? I mean, I, I know we can get overwhelmed with statistics, but what should we keep in our heads? Like, what do you think we should actually um, absorb in terms of where things are and, and how they're new, if you think they are? So a couple things to think about. So number one, um, 
the ADL has been tracking anti-Semitic incidents longer than the FBI, let alone any other NGO in the United States. We've been doing it since the 70s. Um, we do it through our field offices. We investigate every report we get, so we verify, because sometimes people will report something that isn't really anti-Semitic. We, we look at acts of harassment, vandalism, and violence. So vandalism and violence are actual crimes, right? Harassment is not, but your, your orthodox you know, uncle gets yelled at on a street corner in Brooklyn. We track that even if law enforcement won't do anything about mm. that because it's not a crime. We look at that. And number one. Number two, let's also acknowledge that hate crimes and biases are likely underreported. People are afraid. People don't know to. Whatever. So I want to keep that in mind as well. When you raise awareness, likely more stuff gets reported. So there is some of that. But the reality is that something unmistakable started happening in 2016 when the numbers more than doubled in the second half of the year. And I would argue that the campaign and all of the uglies that it surfaced and, you know, candidate Trump, like welcoming extremists, you know, from the margins into the mainstream. And I don't mean that like rhetorically, like they were credentialing white supremacist media for their events. How do we know that? Because we follow white supremacist media at the ADL. So we know that that's what they were doing because we saw it happen. And even if that, that story wasn't necessarily being reported by many, we watched it and it worked. And there was a kind of intemperate rhetoric that I think, you know, was in the, in the public discourse, Abby, that really also changed things. And so indeed today, the numbers are at least double. I mean, 2019 was the highest year ever. In 2020, when we expected, Abby, because of COVID-19, you know, the shutdown started in early March. And so college campuses were closed and businesses were shuttered, and we were all socially distancing at home. And that the total, we expected it would plummet. It did go down, Abby, 4%. It was still the third highest total we ever saw. I mean, it's stunning. It's stunning. So- Can you weave in also the, um, the anti-Semitism that came out of blame on the pandemic? I mean, blaming Jews Well, I was just gonna pandemic? say, and we don't yet have the data on 2021, but I can tell you two things that we saw in 2021. Number one, the explosion of anti-Semitic rhetoric around COVID-19. Blaming Jews for singularly spreading the virus. I mean, we're here in New York. Remember Mayor de Blasio? He felt the need to don a windbreaker and go break up an Orthodox wedding in the middle of the night. He's the hero. Uh, you know, the, the pointing in the New York Times, literally the New York Times, using pictures of Orthodox men like as a thumbnail on the app to represent COVID-19 stories. It was outrageous. So we had accusations that Jews were responsible for the virus. Some people say the Jewish state was a bioweapon. I mean, it's insane that Jews were spreading it. The Jews were profiting from it is another thing that I heard. You know, and it's interesting today, Albert Borla, who's the Jewish CEO of, I think it's Pfizer, he, he, got the Gen he was awarded the Genesis Prize. Good for him. But to suggest that Jews are trying to profit from the virus is insane. So we saw a lot of that. But the second thing that we saw, Abby, um, and by the way, the anti-vax crazy right and left. But then um, the violent anti-Semitism tends to come from far-right extremists across the board, always. And yet, this past May, we had the fighting in Gaza, which triggered an explosion of anti-Semitism in America. We had a 115% increase in the month of May, year over year. And none of the offenders were wearing MAGA hats, right? They weren't coming from Trump rallies. They were coming from anti-Israel rallies and beating Jews in broad daylight for the crime of wearing a kippah. So I think this is one of the reasons why I hear from so many leaders is because it's like you're, we're getting it from all sides and we simply are. And it's alarming. And so when the, when the FBI special agent in charge says what he did on Saturday afternoon, or when the AP reports this kind of thing, it leaves many people feeling, again, more adrift and, and somewhat alone. You said um, in a talk I heard you gave years ago that anti-Semitism is unequivocally, anti-Zionism, I'm sorry, is unequivocally anti-Semitism. I want to say it again, that anti-Zionism is unequivocally anti-Semitism. But I don't have to tell you, and I want to get these, these hits out of the way, because you know you're hit, as, as, as you told me before we met today, from both the right and left, yeah. that, that, you're, that you're too easy on the left. And that where what you just cited, and particularly what we saw last May, where it felt like you weren't seeing people stand up for our community the way that our community has had stood up for theirs, 
post George Floyd, et cetera, and, and in past um, in past other movements, that there really was kind of a, a collective silence on social media and, and in terms of the press, and obviously in terms of the way the mainstream press covered it. How do you respond? I know it's a lot, but how do you respond to that accusation? And how how can you put last May in some context? Because it's quieted for now, but I think it laid something there that shook many of us, and particularly many of us with with kids on campus um, who are seeing a real sea change. So um, there's a lot to say. So let me try to step back. So when I say anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, it's because it is. I'm sure everybody heard that. Now, listen, I understand if you are, you know, uh, a Satmar who doesn't believe that the political state of Israel, you know, is is hal- halakhically legitimate. Okay. And I understand if you're a Palestinian who's displaced from their village in 1948, you're not going to be marching the Israel Day Parade anytime soon. You know, and the Nakba is still a real and deep pain. And I also understand that there are structural inequities in Israel that present real challenges for the Arab-Israeli or if you want to say Palestinian population inside Israel. I get all that. And there are power dynamics with Israel and the Palestinian Authority, or Israel and the Palestinian population, which are real too. I get that all as well. But let's be clear. Zionism is racism isn't a construct that, you know, that, you know, the uh, electronic intifada came up with. You can credit the USSR. It was a strategy and a tactic used in the Cold War, literally, try to foment anti-Western sentiment. Zionism is a, is a theory of liberation that believes that Jews have the right to self-determination. If you believe that Palestinians have the right to self-determination, I think it's racist to think that Jews don't have the same right. Just think so. Now, we can have problems with the way that State of Israel conducts some policies, but I really believe in Netan Sharansky's 3D test. Right. If you demonize all Israelis, if you delegitimize the state, if you hold to double standards, that's anti-Semitism. And just to put in some context, people could have very strong feelings about policies of the state of Israel, Abby. Very strong. You can be angry with some of the policies. And look, I will say right up front, Abby, like I fervently believe, look, I'm an unapologetic Zionist. Make no bones about it. And furthermore, I, I truly believe that the only way we can ever really have a safe and secure Israel will be with a a Palestinian state alongside of it that creates, offers dignity and equality to Palestinians. Both people, both people have a right to self-determination. I hope that both people will be able to have states that can coexist with one another. I truly do. I think that's the only long-term solution. That's what I believe. That's kind of out of vogue in many places, but I don't really care. I think that's the, that's the facts as they are. Now, I, that, can yeah. I say one thing? That being yeah. said, that being said, as we saw happen in May, I mean, look, while Jews are getting beaten up in the street simply because they were being held responsible for what Israel did, irrespective of their opinion on a two-state solution, I thought a lot about my friends in the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. You know, you can have very strong feelings about Beijing. You can have very strong things about what's happened with the Uyghur population. In, in, in the northwest, in northwest of China. You can have very strong feelings about how they've handled democracy in Hong Kong. You can have very strong feelings about the surveillance state. You can have very strong feelings about how they dealt with COVID-19. But can I tell you something? That doesn't give you the license to hold all Chinese people responsible. That doesn't give you the right to demand that Chinese people should denounce their homeland or their ties to it in order to have access to, I don't know, social justice spaces, and it certainly doesn't justify assaulting Asian American people in public places. And it doesn't justify, in my opinion, going on Twitter just days after, days after this hostage crisis in uh, Texas and saying things like, F the Zionist genocidal death cult, the genocidal death cult that is Zionism. Like, I'm sorry, in what world would that be considered okay? And I don't think we can hold all Muslims collectively responsible for Saudi Arabia or Iran or Pakistan or, by the way, you know, the PA and Hamas. And I don't think we can hold all Asian people responsible for Pyongyang or Beijing's policies. And I don't think we can hold Jews responsible for what happens, you know, in Israel. Period. End of story. 
We're going to go to questions, so I want to include people to put them in the chat. But before we do, I mean, there's so much to cover. I want you to to just stay with we us for a minute. We have three more hours, right? <laughs> in ter- this is why people have to engage the book, for sure. Um, in engage? Terms of- I think you mean buy the book, not engage the buy. book. Okay. And read it. Read it and discuss it. it. Go to the library. Um, in, in terms of being written out of social justice spaces, which we see happening everywhere, if someone is an affirmed or a proud Zionist, I just want you to tell as condensed as you can, um, just a snapshot, which is the Starbucks incident, sure. um, and what Linda Sarsour and Tamika Mallory, how they criticized ADL's role in addressing the racism there. I mean, we were the organization in, it was like February or March 2017, that you know saw um, Tamika Mallory, who's one of the organizers, not really one of the organizers, one of the chairs of the Women's March. She was at the Savior's Day event with Louis Farrakhan, and she had feted him on social media, as had Linda Sarsour, who I think many people probably know. And so we called that out and said, "You can't say that you're for you know equality for all people and then stand behind this notorious, obnoxious, you know, unrepentant anti-Semite." And Louis Farrakhan is of a, is a piece of work. And then a couple months later, the Starbucks thing happened where there was a racist incident in in Philadelphia where two black men were, you know, arrested and they said they want to use the bathroom and didn't want to buy anything. And I got a call from my former colleagues at Starbucks who said, hey, this was an incident. We want to do some kind of training. We know you know how to do training. And we do. ADL is one of the largest providers of anti-bias content in the United States. We reach a million and a half kids a year, like a million and a half kids a year, thousands and thousands and thousands of schools all over the country. So I said, sure, we'd love to try to help. But when it was announced that they were they were going to do an event or some kind of programming with Equal Justice Initiative, um, Equal Justice Initiative, and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, um, Demos, all great organizations, they were led, two of which were led by women of color. And then there's Brian Stevenson, who's like, should be a Nobel laureate running EJI, and ADL. Some people in the activist community led by Tamika Mallory were like, oh, Why should ADL be involved? They're a racist institution. They are anti-black, anti-brown, anti-Muslim. I mean, I think that's bananas. I think it was evil and wrong. And I think it was deeply mischaracterizing all the good work that we've done for decades and decades and decades. I mean, my predecessors, not only marched in the civil rights movement, you know, in the 1950s and 1960s, but the work that we do today across the country, bringing cases, filing amicus briefs, doing all this work. And so that was really hurtful to me because I thought it was so gross and mischaracterized. And in the end, Starbucks actually kept us involved, but sort of like pushed us down, like mm-hmm. didn't want us to be that prominent feature because they came under such siege from these activists. But like, you know, I got to be honest, Abby, if the if if the if the how can I put this? If the price of calling out anti-Semites and anti-Semitism is getting playing second fiddle on something like that, so be it. What do I care? I mean, I think ultimately exposing that T- Tamika Mallory's anti-Semitism in that moment and her acquiescence to Louis Farrakhan, let alone what the stuff, I mean, the stuff we've shown about Linda Sosser over the years, like, I don't apologize for that. I would do it again in a, do it again in a heartbeat. You have a, a large section in this book is a charge to us. You say mm-hmm. hate isn't someone else's problem. It's your problem. It's our problem. Yeah. We are the solution. And that that's a lot. I mean, that's strong, strong words. They are, they're harder to uh, actually realize, I think, for each of us in our own lives and our our day to day interactions with people. Um, and I don't we don't have time for you to give to give the, the menu of what you are you're suggesting. But can you just give us a snapshot? Maybe you want to do the three S's, something that gives us a sense of how we can concretize this idea. And it isn't it isn't just a sense of kind of pushing back or staying alert or being vigilant. Like, how do we practicalize this? Okay. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a fourth S. I'm going to do something different here. Well, I didn't say what the first three are. I'm going to tell you what they are. So I literally wrote the book because I felt like people said to me, well, what do I do? And there's some great books out there about anti-Semitism, amazing books. I'm going to give a shout out to Dara Horn, whose book is wonderful. You know, it's such a good book about anti-Semitism and, you know, the affection. Why people love dead Jews. Yeah, it's just an amazing book. I think David Baddiel's book, Jews Don't Count, is also really great. I've read many other great books over the years. I think Anti-Semitism Here and Now by Deborah Lipstadt's a wonderful book. I think Barry Weiss's book is pretty good. 
um, how to fight his sentence. But none of them said, well, what do I do? What do I do? So basically, I wrote the book for, and it has chapters, like if you're a parent, if you're an educator, if you're a clergy member, if you're like in a corporation, like an HR or even an entrepreneur just running your own business, like or an ordinary citizen, what do you do? Like that's literally why I wrote the book and I use all of ADL's tactics and techniques. So that's literally how the book is organized. So, so what do you do? I'll give you a simple heuristic. First of all, I think we need to do is you need to, you need to speak out. Or let's say speak up. You need to speak up. So we, the best way, as I said before, maybe I didn't say this. We believe our theory of change is the best way to handle hate is to interrupt intolerance before it happens. And so whether it's at the dinner table or the water cooler or the, you know, the, the playing field or your Facebook feed, right, or your, or your WhatsApp chat, you got you to gotta call out hate when it happens. Particularly, we need to, like, break out of our tribes, Abby, like, if you're a conservative person, you other conservative people saying lunatic things about George Soros, call it out. If you're on the left and you hear crazy people saying anti-Zionist stuff, call it out. We've got to be willing, again, to look in the mirror. I really believe that. And call it hate when it happens. By the way, can I just say one thing? So I think we also really, we need to cancel, cancel culture. We Jews should remember the value of tshuva. Like, unless you're a serial offender... I can think of Mel Gibson, who's unwilling to acknowledge their sins. Like, everybody deserves a chance to repent. I don't think we should be canceling people at all. Counseling, yes. Canceling, no. no so number one, speak up. Number two, you got to share facts. Like, don't forward that email from your neighbor's father-in-law's cousin Larry, you know, that says, oh, COVID-19 was created by aliens. I mean, I think we need to focus on facts. We need to dial down the emotions. We need to keep people grounded. Like, talk to people online like you do in real life. That's pretty good. And slow it down. Don't, don't tweet out the first thing you think of. Like, my mom taught me that when I was a kid, and we'd all be well served to remember that. So share facts. Number three, show strength. We can't cower, you know, in the face of bigotry. I think we need to, sh to show strength and show up. That means going to show on Saturday morning, like I said. It means n go shop at that kosher supermarket. It means, again, like, have faith and, and, and double down. Fourth thing I think we need to do, if we want to stop it from happening here, is we need to step into the breach. Like, go to that school board meeting. Like, run for your local election board. Like, like volunteer and participate in civic life. Democracy is not a spectator sport that you can take in from the cheap seats and just assume that everything's going to work out. It won't. It won't. And our own history as Jews should tell us that. You know, remember the old Lotto commercial? Abby, you got to be in it to win it. Goes for democracy as well. Good. Jerry's asking, did you start writing this book before the January 6th insurrection? And how did it impact your writing? I did. I started writing this book in the second half of 2020. Um, and I was working on the, I'd written the proposal and I was working on the chapters and then I hadn't sold it yet. And then when uh, January 6th happened, I was like, <laughs> like, this is it. Like what I, what I was afraid could happen, could, what I was afraid might happen, could happen right here and is happening right here. Because I think January 6th should really be a wake up call. Anybody who thinks men beating police officers wearing Camp Auschwitz sweatshirts or six MWE sweatshirts right, with Confederate flags are just tourists, is, is you're out of your mind. You're either delusional or you're like profoundly ignorant. And so this, is, this isn't this is just bad for democracy, it's bad for the Jews. So that really led me to get this thing going. Jews were obviously very divided about Trump and some felt like he was very good for Israel, very good for our community because he moved the embassy, because of the Abraham Accords. Um, and on the other side, that he was really sowing the hate you described, um, unleashing kind of sewer kind of, uh, of dialogue, um, and, and is referring to his comment where he said any Jew, any Jew that votes for a Democrat is being disloyal. Yeah. Can you talk about that tension? And I know, again, that, that could have its own hour. It is a tension. I mean, it's undeniable that he said those things. He said he wanted his man counting his money to be wearing be short wearing yarmulkes. <clears throat> he said so. He he he's, he when he in a, before an audience of Jews he talked about 
like Prime Minister Netanyahu is your Prime Minister from your country. I mean, he regularly engaged in anti-Semitic tropes against Soros and others. I mean, it was despicable. And again, he he welcomed white supremacists into the public discourse. I mean, he gave interviews to Alex Jones. I mean, this stuff is like mind bending. And at the same time, yes, he has Jewish grandchildren and a Jewish daughter and son-in-law who I believe he loves. And yes, I mean, by the way, so technically speaking, Abby, you never had a president in the history of America who had a deeper personal relationship with the Jewish people than Donald Trump. You just didn't. You had Jewish grandchildren running around the residence. I mean, that's extraordinary. And he did move the embassy, which was a bipartisan commitment, first made by Bill Clinton in the 1990s. And he did, like, call out Iran's, like, ugly, ugly, unfettered campaign of anti-Semitism. And he did do so much other things. He did other things that were good. And he did other things that were bad. I mean, it's complicated. I mean, tr- there's a lot of things I, I, I could say, and we don't have enough time. But the bottom line is there was absolutely a tension there. And we should have the ability to hold two thoughts in our head at the same time. There are things about him that I think are, are absolutely terrible. There are things about him that I also can't deny. It's just it's the way life is. Life is rarely just so black and white. It's often very gray. Neil is asking if you can comment on the use of the term globalist by politicians and the role that that plays in the current climate of anti-Semitism. How should Jews respond to the mainstream use of that trope? Who asked that question? Neil, someone named Neil. Neil, it's such a good question. Globalist is a euphemism for Jew in white supremacist circles. And this is a good example of like the hate laundering that's gone on in recent years. We haven't even talked about social media, Abby, but like the way that some of the most disgusting, vile excrement has moved from like, like private, you know, private chats to subreddits to, you know, Facebook to like, Tucker Carlson's talking points at night. Let me be clear. Globalist is a term that's used by white supremacists to talk about Jews. You know, and and it plays into these old tropes about Jews controlling the world. And then suddenly it started to be used in public discourse around like George Soros and other prominent Jews. I mean, and even if the people using it don't understand its roots, that doesn't not make it problematic and wrong. Just like people rooting for the Washington Redskins might not have understood its roots, but it was still hurtful and hateful to Native Americans. I mean, so I think we've got to recognize that dichotomy and call that out for what it is. It's an anti-Semitic term. The uh, DEI efforts in schools, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, particularly in schools, often don't include the Jewish story or Jews. Can you address that? Deeply problematic. I have right here a report from the Heritage Foundation that talks specifically about this. Inclusion delusion, the anti-Semitism of DEI in staff at universities. It is a problem. I mean, we're living in a time today when I think DEI is often seen only through a very narrow prism, which is issues of race. Now, there's, there's a reason for that. I mean, you know, this country was built in many ways on the backs of enslaved Africans, And there still are massive structural inequities in our society. And systemic discrimination is very real. You don't have to believe me. You could ask a person of color. You can just look at the data. It's all absolutely true. And so often DEI, which have like these programs have leapt into the mainstream after the murder of George Floyd, focus narrowly on that lens. So Jews are hard because many of us do present as white, even if we don't like self-identify that way. And people think, well, Judaism is just a religion, even though we know we're also ethnic, too. So, Or like, how can I be anti-Semitic if that person says he's Jewish, but he's an atheist? He doesn't believe in God. So I don't hate him. I just think he's a, he's a globalist who's trying to control the world. I'm saying all this very quickly just to make the point that I think the answer is not to give up on DEI. It's to make DEI better. Because we do need to address these issues, and it needs to include the Jewish perspective. And we need to make sure that the nuance and complexity of our condition is understood and integrated into these programs in the boardroom, at the university, you know, across the board. I'm going to give you, where I've gotten permission from on high to go a little longer, so because I want to get to a few So only more two more hours. <laughs> um, you, you had Heidi's asking a question that made me think of you cited one of your experts, um, I think, in, in I don't know if she's a terrorism ex- expert or extremism expert, um, was talking about how she actually has a plan B. She has a place she's going to go if it gets really bad. Heidi's asking 
if American Jews ever had to flee, where can we go? I mean, again, this could be a question that feels out of the realm, but many people are thinking this way. I don't think it's out of the realm. So, look, I have a few thoughts on that. First of all, I, I mean, I deeply, like I said, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a, Zion, a Zionist of great conviction. And so I think that we're blessed in so much of the privilege we enjoy, I think, in America and around the world is because there's a sovereign Jewish state. So we should never be, as we were for thousands of years, you know, alone. Um, at the same time, look, America was plan B for my grandfather. America was plan B for my wife. America is plan B for me. So I'm not thinking about what's my exit path. I'm thinking about how do I make this work here and now? Because this has been the greatest, like I also will acknowledge, I believe in American exceptionalism. And I do think that the reality is this has been the greatest, most vibrant, most durable, most dynamic, most flexible democracy in the history of the world. Full of flaws, lots of problems. I mentioned the, 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 uh, the reality of structural racism in this country. And I also acknowledge the, you know, the, the genocide and the displacement of Native Americans on these lands, right? All that being said, this country has been striving for a more perfect union since it was founded almost 250 years ago. So Abby, we gotta make this country work. I don't think we could say, oh, we'll run to Canada or Australia, you know, or, or Senegal or, you know, Thailand. I think, again, I would, I would not begrudge anyone. I have family in Israel, spent a lot of time there. I deeply believe in the Jewish homeland, but this is the place where I was born. This is the place where I hope that my grandchildren will be born. This is the place I want us to make work. I'm Judy's not, asking. I'm not giving up on America so fast. Judy's asking, what can you do about members of Congress on both sides of the aisle who are clearly anti-Semitic? Um, this is hard. I mean, I think anti-Semitism has not only been normalized, as I was just saying before in the context of the globalist comment, it's also been politicized in ways that are really ugly and unfortunate. You have folks on the left like to point to people on the right and say they're anti-Semitic. You have folks on the right who like to point to folks on the left and say they're anti-Semitic. It's up to all of us to ask, particularly to the people to whom we might, whose campaigns we volunteer for, for whom we might vote, to whom we might donate, to ask them to do better. And, you know, I think, I think my job at the ADL is not to, I don't, you know, we're a tax-exempt nonprofit. Like, we're nonpartisan. I don't give money to candidates. I'm not in this guy's camp or that gal's camp. Our goal is to call balls and strikes for both sides. Deborah's asking about the cancellation of Jews and Jewish Hollywood founders from the grand opening of the museum in LA about the film industry. Just atrocious. First catch up, just atrocious. give They just built a new museum in Hollywood, the museum of like motion pictures. And I was actually there on opening night. And I walked the galleries and I turned to the guy, gentleman I was with, another Jewish person, turned to Julian and I said, uh, where are the Jews? Because there was no mention, no mention. When I say no mention, I mean, it's like six floors, zero mentions of the, the, the Warner Brothers or Lewis Mayer or, um, you know, Wasserstein or any of the people who built the industry. I mean, Hollywood was created by Jews who were fleeing anti-Semitism in the East Coast. And it, they were able to do what they did because it was a brand new industry they built themselves. And they were, you know, the, the Raoud Institute think tank in Israel has got this term they've coined called erasive anti-Semitism. And there's something to it, like, you know, just omitting Jews, omitting Jews for, as actors in the civil rights movement, omitting Jews from creating Hollywood, omitting Jews from being part of the American story. And I, I called it out, you know, there was just a big piece in Rolling Stone on this. It's worth reading. Someone could, you can look up Rolling Stone and Hollywood Museum, you'll see it. I think I'm quoted in it. It's, it's really a problem, Abby. And we're now talking to the museum, by the way, ADL is, and I believe they're going to be addressing it. I know social media is a huge part of your book. It's, it's someone's quite a few questions here. The Stop Hate for Profit campaign, which it was remarkable how many companies signed on in record time. But when you actually sat down with Zuckerberg and Sandberg, was there any movement? Was there any response? Did they take it seriously? And if you could just, again, encapsulate what was the campaign about? So we launched, so look, I worked in Silicon Valley for many years. I've raised money on Sand Hill Road. I've started business. I've been fortunate to sell a couple things. Um, I've been, been lucky, but I know that world really well. And so 
when I came here to ADL, I was stunned by what I saw on social media vis-a-vis the anti-Semitism and the racism and the toxicity, the Islamophobia, it's all nuts. And so I felt like Facebook was the front line in fighting hate. So we opened a center in Silicon Valley in 2017 with the first Jewish group, I think the first civil rights group to have a presence in the Valley. And I didn't staff it with, you know, God, you know, Jewish communal professionals. I, I hired a recruited executive from Reddit and we have computer scientists and software engineers from Twitter and Yahoo and other companies working there. I mean, it's it's really pretty impressive what I think they've been able to build. So we work with the companies. I mean, uh, you know, Abby, I said this somewhere the other day, like, God help us if we're waiting for some Octanigerian senator, you know, with his hotmail address to help, you know, solve quantum computing. Like, you can forget about it. Um, you think so-and-so, you know, with their AOL account is going to understand the metaverse, Right. But unfortunately, while some companies, I think, like, I would point to um, Reddit's been very good. I think uh, YouTube has been decent, is pretty good as well. Um, Google generally. But I must say, like, I found Facebook to be the most intransigent, the most difficult. And look, like, I know Cheryl, full disclosure, she was a donor to ADL. She's a donor to ADL. I met Zuckerberg. I met many of their executives. I think they're good people. And yet I think collectively they have made the wrong decisions again and again and again. And they've, they like prioritize freedom of expression over every other value. And so, you know, if, if the, if the striker center has a program that slanders someone, you could be sued for it. But the Facebook and the social media companies have an exemption because of a loophole in the law. So we organized with the NAACP and LULAC and Latino advocacy group and Common Sense Media, a bunch of civil rights groups, we went to businesses and said, do you want your content showing up on Facebook next to white supremacist extremist, you know, poison? And we gave them screenshots of like Salesforce and, you know, P&G and other big brands next to toxic, hateful stuff. And none of them want that. And Facebook was unwilling to do anything about it. So we organized this, this walkout, this one month ad pause. We had no company signed up when we started, Abby. Within three weeks... We had Disney, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Levi's, Hershey's, Volkswagen. We had over 1,200 advertisers at the end of the day. And it prompted Facebook to finally do some things, right? They finally started classifying Holocaust denialism as hate speech. They finally started taking out white supremacist groups. They agreed to hire a VP of civil rights. They agreed to audit their hate content. Things they had not agreed to do until our campaign. So, look, there's still a behemoth. You know, they still will earn something like $120 billion this year, but they have got to do more to tackle anti-Semitism on their platform without any question. Deborah Lipstadt's confirmation. Uh, what do you feel are the prospects at this point? I think they're high. I mean, I think... Uh, professor Tell us Lipstadt, again what she's being... You know. so professor, uh, Deborah Lipstadt is a professor of Holocaust studies at Emory University. She's an esteemed scholar. Um, she's, an, she's a best-selling author. She got a lot of prominence because she was involved in a libel suit in the UK that was made into a movie starring Rachel Weisz, Jewish actress. Um, And she was nominated for the Special Envoy for Global Anti-Semitism role at the State Department. um, And it's been held up in the confirmation process. Full disclosure, ADL is one of the organizations that advocated that the Special Envoy role be promoted to an ambassador rank. We were one of the groups who really drove that process. Now, instead of the president being able to put his person in place, she's got to be confirmed by the Senate. And it's got caught in the partisan gridlock of the moment. I think she's going to get through. You know, we are advocating hard for her to be confirmed, like we advocated hard for Elon Carr, her president, her predecessor in the Trump administration to be approved. Like, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, I don't care. What I care is, are you going to fight anti-Semitism? Are you going to help us protect the Jewish people? So I think she'll get through. I'm optimistic. By the way, a lot of the president's nominees are caught up too, not just Deborah. So I think eventually this will get done. And finally, uh, the the recent uh, Charlottesville decision, uh, the legal decision in the Charlottesville case um, versus the white supremacists uh, were the, the right outcome, I think we would all agree, happened. What yep. are the implications? Uh, big implications. This is from Diane. So thank you, Diane, for the question. Full disclosure, ADL helped fund that camp, helped fund the lawsuit. We're on the board of Integrity First, Robbie Kaplan's amazing organization that brought the suit. And we provided a ton of the research for Robbie and the team. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's precedent setting. I think you're going to see more cases. You know, ADL in 1990 was involved in a case with SPLC that helped bankrupt the white Aryan resistance. And we just filed a case last month 
with the DC Attorney General against the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys. We're going to try to take them down. We're going to try to bankrupt them. I don't want them infiltrating school boards. I don't want them bringing their extremism. In, I mean, we're seeing the localization of extremism, Abby, where these guys are trying to, again, use their coffers to fund their campaigns. We're going to try to shut that down. Like, I think, again, I think, again, if you, if you incite violence, if you, if you incite violence, that's not protected speech. That's dangerous and you should be held to account. I'm going to take a, a moderator's prerogative and just ask my final question. Please. It struck me. It struck me that you, in your instructions to us, said that we should remain calm and dispassionate mm -hmm. when we are talking to people that we're trying to kind of course correct. But you also have a section that you title "Why I'm So Emotional," and I think it came out of a meeting where you were sitting with someone who maybe either accused you of that or you thought that's what he was thinking about the heat with which you were presenting your ideas. I guess I would, a lot of us are, are feeling pretty emotional and I would love you to end with, I guess, why you are. So that was a meeting with a social media executive and afterwards she said to a th someone else, she said, Jonathan, he was so emotional in the meeting. And this person shared it to me and I, and I was like, of course I'm emotional. Like the question isn't why am I emotional, it's why isn't she? Why isn't everyone? Look, anti-Semitism, whether it comes from the far right or the radical left, whether it comes from black Hebrew Israelites who shoot people in supermarkets or you know, radicalized Muslims who take them hostage at gunpoint, like it is a danger to all of us. I think we need to be emotional and passionate. And yet at the same time, we need to be deliberate and dispassionate in the way that we deal with it, which means again, Yes, we need to build walls and make sure that our children are secure. And yes, we also need security through solidarity, like to work with other communities, to build bridges and to create common bonds because we have much more in common than the things that which divide us. Um, but the biggest challenge of all, I think, Abby, why we have to be impassioned but intentional, right? Emotional but like, you know, still clinical is because it's going to be a long fight. There's no silver bullet. There's no magic wand. You, you, you can't go like this and suddenly anti-Semitism will go away. This requires a whole of society strategy and it's really the fight of our lives. And I think it's the fight of our lives. I think it's the fight for our lives. So I would encourage everybody to, to knuckle down, to be ready and to call the stuff out when it happens, irrespective of the consequences it causes because this is what we need if we want to preserve what we've got. Thank you, Jonathan Greenblatt. Thank you for the work you're doing at ADL and your team. And I do encourage people to get this book for their families, for themselves. Um, and to, it's it, again, it's not just uh, an incredible education, it's a charge. Um, I always wanna thank the Stryker Center for having me. Uh, I don't take for granted that they trust me. And at some point, I hope I, I, I think there will be a day when they don't invite me back. But for now, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. So particular shout out to Rabbi Davidson and to Gotti Levy and Erica Resnick. And they reminded me to remind you that Deborah Lipstadt is going to be speaking at Stryker. So check the Stryker website. And right. uh, Albert, um, Albert Burla, uh, Dr. Albert Burla, who uh, Jonathan mentioned, also coming up at Stryker. They're, they're always ahead of the curve. Thank you all for being here. Um, and again, here is uh, to peace in, in our homes, both worship and personal. And I'm really glad that you joined us tonight. Take care. Thank you.